let's look at the investment management business. And for this, we'll use as a proxy the mutual fund industry, which is a really good proxy because we've got plenty of data on it. You don't, we don't know exactly how others are doing. And that is, if you think about the mutual fund industry, it's charging around 2% a year for its wares. So if you can, and, and what are they getting as an average return? All these managers together, competing with one another, turn out to be average. What else is new? Uh, you know, everybody thinks they're going to be above average, but in the, in the long run, the average is composed of that same group of managers and they have to be average, but they're only averaging average before they deduct the cost of investing. So um, 2% is around a little bit less, 1% or a little bit less in expense ratios, including the investment man management fee, marketing costs, administrative costs, things of that nature. But it's around 1% on average for the industry now. When I came into the business, by the way, I will say parenthetically, with this tiny industry, the average cost was half of 1%. So as it got huge, the cost kept going up. So you got a double whammy, a great business, but a bad profession. Uh, and great for the business side, bad for the fiduciary side. Great for the money managers, bad for the fund investors. This is not a proposition that I ever warmed up much to once I figured it out. So in any event, here we have the mutual fund managers. Uh, oh, let me just finish besides the, the advisory fee and, and total expense ratio is around 1%. Then you've got the funds are doing a lot of trading within their portfolio. And that's probably about half of 1%. And the funds are holding cash, where in the long run cash loses to the stock market. And that's about 10 basis points. And they're ten, one tenth of 1%. And then left out of all the data we see are mutual fund sales charges, sales loads, now replaced importantly by uh, advisory fees paid to registered investment advisors. But the marketing system costs a certain amount of money. And I used about 50 basis points for that. We don't really know. Some people don't get into the marketing system. They're just buying no-load funds. They're do-it-yourself investors. Uh, but some people are paying one or one and a half percent. So I used 50. And so we're now at about 210. And that's in the article I wrote for the Financial Analyst Journal in, in January of 2014. Uh, called the all-in expenses of mutual funds. Think about this for a minute. I left out a big cost, taxes, because I was talking largely about retirement plans. And then I left out a huge cost, which is the difference between the returns fund report, funds report, and the returns investors actually get. And since investors have bad timing and make bad choices, mutual fund investors lag the returns of their funds According to Morningstar, looking at 15 years, by two and one half percent a year, and if taxes are say one and a quarter percent a year, that's another. Well, let's let me make it one bad, one and a half just for the fun of it, so I get a nice round four percentage points added to the two. And uh, then we'll take that one step further. Uh, so we've got a six percent investor experience. And this is not hyperbole. I mean, this is supported by the data. Uh, and uh, so then let's look at the stock market return. And let's assume it's 7% in, in the coming years. And let's assume we have 3% inflation. Let's say 4% real return, which you're spending 6% to get. It's a, probably a little ambitious, but corporate America grows along with the GDP. It's not complicated, not step by step, but they look kind of, if you get far enough away from the chart, they look like the same line. So I've, I've now got to real return here. And the real return is on mutual funds over time has been negative. The real return after this. Now let's talk about the role just of costs on that for a minute. And uh, let's think about an investor starting investing today, maybe like some of your students, uh, who's going to invest for a lifetime. Think about a lifetime in two ways. Number one, Let's assume that the market can deliver 7%. The historical return is 9%. Well, I'm going to knock that down because the dividend is 2%. The yield is 2% less, and it will probably stay more or less in the new range of 2 rather than the old range of 4, 4.5. It's a guess, but it doesn't really matter. We're just hy hypothesizing here. And uh, so that's um, uh, a total of 7%, 5 and 2. And in the long run, as you observed, speculative return, the changes in people's willingness to pay, 
how much to pay for a dollar of earnings over the very long run is zero. Big in this decade, negative in that decade. It's all over the place decade by decade. But over your investment lifetime, you can expect it to be more or less zero and particularly compounded over that period because if it goes from, let's say, 20 today to 15, 75 years from now, that's almost nothing in terms of annual annual rate. So let's look at seven and five. Just the, just the market return, presumed market return, high, uh, maybe rational expectations for market return and subtract the cost, all in costs of fund investing, leaving out those big costs and say you get five. Well, if you're young, starting out today with a 401k plan or a savings plan or an IRA, or maybe have a little bit of money you've earned on the side, uh, and you earn 7%, you'll, you'll get about $160 for each dollar you invest over 75 years. It's a long time, but you're gonna be here for a long time. So doesn't that mean you can do this for any time period you want. Uh, so that's $160. And if you get 5%, it's $40. At two percentage points is the difference between, uh, it can increase your, your retirement savings, if you can eliminate it, by 300% uh, from $40 to 160. Yeah, that's right, increased by 300%. And uh, what is the alternative to that? Well, you can go to active managers. Now, if you own three or four funds at a given time that you like, we'll speak just about equity funds here, uh, the average equity fund manager lasts seven years. Uh, the average mutual fund, 50% could go out of business every decade. So the chances are, if you invest for 75 years, unbelievable as this sounds, you'll probably have at least 40 different managers. Is there any realistic possibility that 40 different managers charging 2% a year can get remotely close to the returns earned by the market itself, which is what the index fund does? It doesn't give you seven in fairness. It gives you about 695 because you can buy our all market index fund for, for a five basis points. If you, I think it's over $10,000 you have to get to to do that, but you'll get there pretty quickly. So, the math for not using indexing is just totally devastating, uh, capital destroying. Uh, if we can only get people to look at cost and if we can only get people to look at the long term. And I have this sentence I've developed uh, for investors to think about. Uh, Bill Sharp, Nobel laureate, who liked my, very much liked my addition to his, my extension of his original article on costs and investing. He used the 1% because he didn't take into account all the other costs. He, li he liked my addition and he liked my final sentence in that article, which said, I think I can get this about right. Um, I don't think I said for God's sake, but I'll say it here. For God's sake, don't let the miracle of long-term compounding of return be overwhelmed by the tyranny of the long-term compounding of costs. I mean, just think about it in this way. You put up 100% of the capital. You take 100% of the risk and you get a quarter, 25% of the return that you ought to be able to earn without, without pushing yourself. If you think that's a good deal, I think you better check your math book or something. So it's there and it's true and it's irrefutable. The relentless rules, as, as uh, Justice Brandeis said in a different context, the Relentless Rules of Humble Arithmetic. By right means diversify, diversify, diversify in an index fund, which is a great way to invest uh, for reasons I've talked about earlier. Uh, you at low cost and all that, but you're diversified. So the in, in, intricate ins and outs of the market, you know, steel stocks are doing better, or energy stocks are doing better, or healthcare is doing better, or technology is doing better. Uh, if you own the whole market, you get your share of all of that. So, but uh, that, that's the buy right, very diversified. And the hold tight is what we've talked a little bit about, and that is, you know, when you get these periods of adversity and fear uh, and greed, uh, don't do anything, okay? Uh, well, the bagel and the donut is uh, a talk I gave years ago, and I contrasted like the investment world, 
The bagel is nutritious and good for you, substantive, uh, while the donut has a certain sweetness and it kind of breaks up and crumbles when you eat it. And uh, so long-term investing, holding on, is the uh, strategy I just described, is the bagel, and short-term speculation is the donut. Just a way of visualizing you know, which you want, which is the best for you in the long run. And sometimes people may think I'd just soon have a couple of donuts, but they're not gonna do you any good. With all due respect for the donut makers of America. <laughs>